it's easy to describe Kyle. Kyle's the most exciting public speaker in Scotland. He's his passion, hard work, and talent have led him to you know multiple uh, public speaking accolades. He's been a two-time Toastmaster District One Seven uh, Seventy One Evaluation Champion, as well as European Champion Twenty Twenty One. Keep it really short to hear from the man himself. Turn it over to Kyle Marta, please. Thank you very much, Ratna. They say that feedback is the breakfast of champions. But if that feedback is just piled on the plate, or if it's just served without a smile, if it's a little bit undercooked, it can leave a bitter taste in the speaker, the audience, and in some cases, the judges' mouths, which of course is not what we want to do when we're delivering feedback in Toastmasters. So what I'd like to do today is share with you my three key ingredients to a brilliant feedback breakfast. One which will really have the judges, the audience, the speaker talking for days about how delicious it was. So that is the game plan today. And let me just dive straight in with the big question for you. Because this question right here is going to really determine how effective your evaluations are. So let me ask you, what do you think is the purpose of a Toastmasters evaluation? What do you think is the purpose? Maybe type into the chat for me. What do you think is the purpose of a Toastmasters evaluation? What do you think? To make the speaker better, I'm getting from Keith. Raise your hand if you would agree with that, to make the speaker better. Tim saying to give feedback to everyone in the meeting. Most people would say to get make the speaker better. <laughs> Tim, on the other hand, is an incredibly smart human being. And the reason, the purpose for a Toastmasters evaluation is not to make the speaker better, is actually to help the room get better. And this brings me to my first ingredient. You must, you must treat your evaluation like a speech. Because if you treat your evaluation like a speech, in other words, if you start with a compelling opening, if you have a good flow all the way through, if you speak to the audience instead of just speaking to the speaker, you're going to keep people engaged. And when they listen to you, they're far more likely to take action on your words. So try your best to make your evaluation like a speech. And that is so, and that starts from the very beginning. Have a hook and also for your ending, don't just leave it by saying, I look forward to your next speech. End with a bang, end with something exciting, end with a little bit of humor to get us engaged and get us laughing and thinking even more about your evaluation afterwards. If you do this, you're gonna be so different to any other evaluator, you will instantly stand out. The second key ingredient I have for you is something extremely controversial. And uh, some of you actually might not like me after I say this. The second ingredient is to throw away the sandwich. To throw away the sandwich method. Uh, sandwiches are never shared at breakfast time anyway, but why do you think the sandwich is something we should potentially throw away? Any ideas? Please unmute for me if you've got any ideas why the sandwich needs to go. Is it overused? Absolutely, Liz. I mean, how many sandwiches have we seen? I've seen all flavors, all types of bread. We've seen it again and again and again and again. It's overdone, and I don't think our goal is to be like everyone, is it? Uh, Liz, you've also got your hand up there. Would you like to share? Yes, thank you. Everyone knows you're just using the bread to to coat the problem. Yeah, yeah. It makes well, me absolutely. wince. I know you're going to beat me, so just beat me right away. Yeah, yeah. And over here in the UK, we, we call it um, S-word sandwich. I'm not going to say what the S-word is, but I think you know what I'm talking about here. It's, it's just coating the bad stuff in the middle. But here's the other reason. 
from a competitive point of view, if you are competing in the evaluation contest, if you actually look at the judging form, the judging form goes something like this, analytical quality, which basically means how you analyze a speech, how you point out the positives of a speech. And then you have a whole section for um, feedback or suggestions. In other words, what ways the speech can be improved. And then you have a summary. So if you are using the sandwich method, it makes it quite difficult to score your evaluation because you're hopping between the different sections. What I would suggest instead is actually just share, firstly, your three strengths, the three things that you believe the speaker did well, okay? Get all of the positives up front because that way it fits in with the form. And then second, move on to your recommendations. And I would recommend having two recommendations here, okay? Maybe one to do with the content of the speech and perhaps one to do, of course, with the delivery of the speech and then move on to your summary. Because now what we're doing is we're not confusing people. Our, our, our evaluation becomes very streamlined. Strengths, suggestions, summary. It lines up with the form and it's easy to follow for everyone instead of hopping between, this is what you didn't do well, but this is what you did do well. This is what you didn't do well, but this is what you did do well. It makes it more easy to follow for everyone. I hope you're, uh, you're seeing that. Now, the third key ingredient, and this, this is truly the difference between a, a good evaluator and a, and a great evaluator. A great evaluator will demonstrate his or her suggestions. Now, why do you think it's so important to demonstrate your points? Raise your hand if you'd like to answer that question. Tim, go ahead because many people are visual learners rather than just hearing learners yeah oh absolutely and it's not even just that they're visual learners but it creates immense clarity if you have an example of how something should be done it's a lot easier to follow than just the suggestion and this has to be done for delivery points and for content points so let's say um, Tim was doing a speech and I thought Tim could have used some more effective gestures. I could maybe say, Tim, I thought during your speech, you could have used some more gestures. For example, that part, like the Titanic scene, when you were on the front of the boat, I would have loved to have seen a big open gesture there with the wind blowing in your hair, okay? Um, why is everyone laughing at that? Tim's got hair, what's going on here? Um, anyway, you get my point, it has to be clear and it goes for content as well. What many people will do is they'll say, I didn't find the start of your speech very engaging. Think about intriguing us more, but they won't give an example of what to say. If you're gonna criticize someone's opening, you've got to say precisely what they should have done instead. You've got to say you should have opened with this question or this statement or this point. You've got to literally give a tangible demonstration of what you mean. This will create clarity for the speaker, the audience, and of course the, the judges as well in terms of exactly the point you're trying to get across. So if you can look to do those three things, number one, make it a speech, not an evaluation. Okay, because speeches are so much better than evaluations, aren't they? Secondly, make sure you throw away that sandwich. It is stale, it is smelling, it is not good. Okay, and instead go for a bit more of a streamlined format of strengths, suggestions, and a summary. And then thirdly, demonstrate any of your points, any of your suggestions, demonstrate them so it's crystal clear for everyone who is watching. So I want to move on to a bit of a Q&A now because I think that's where I can probably give the most value for any individual questions that you have. So if you do have one, just um, raise your hand and I'd love to answer any question. Tim, go ahead. This is something that's been picking at the back of my mind for a while. Mm. You are focused here on what we should do to evaluate at a contest, but most of us, most of the time are evaluating in our club. 
-hmm. And there are things such as the project and the purpose of the speech and that sort of thing. How do you take your format and use it in a situation where it's a club where we have to give more information than just what they did well? And, and th does that make sense? It does. It does. Well, basically what you do in that situation is you take the purpose of the speech and you use that as your reference point. In other words, what did the speaker do well to um, align with that purpose, to achieve that purpose? And where could the speaker improve so that they hit that purpose to an even higher level? Okay, so if the, if the project is, um, you know, how they use their body language, what could they have done from a body language standpoint to really elevate things in this particular situation? So I would use the project as your main reference point. And when we're competing, the main reference point is the message of the speech, what the speaker's trying to say. But for a project, use the project itself as the main reference point. Does that help, Tim? Does that make sense? Excellent. Okay. Uh, yeah, Liz, go ahead. Uh, I understand what you're saying about the sandwich method, but it's mm. a great way to train new Toastmasters. Mm -hmm. uh, I, and I would encourage them to use the sandwich method and then as they get more experience to expand their skills. What? How do you work with new Toastmasters? Uh, I would not encourage them to do the sandwich method personally because I think it's a little confusing. I think it's a little confusing telling people to chop and change between different things. If you just say, say what they did well, say how they could improve, summary, and have a positive summary to really make the speaker feel good, I think that's simpler, personally. But hey, everybody's different, different cultures as well, and it's individual preference. Some people love sandwiches, right? So uh, <laughs> if that is the case, that's no problem at all. Uh, Wayne, could I come to you, please? It occurs to me you basically redefined the sandwich. You still have three parts. You treat what's well, you give two recommendations, and then you give a summary. That's still the three parts to a trifecta. And so rather than saying it's not a sandwich, maybe we just focus on put the positive things up front where you can group them, come up with two recommendations, and then summarize. And that's a good model. And the second question I have is the two recommendations. Mm. There's two aspects to that I would like to explore. One is with a truly experienced speaker, such as the one we are observing just now during this webinar, what if you don't really come up with any solid recommendations? Where do you take it? And yeah. secondly, at the other extreme, someone that has so many recommendations, how do you select the two that have the greatest value? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, okay, so kind of three three things there, Wayne. Uh, firstly, I do get what you're saying. Essentially, you, are, you always want to leave the speaker or the person on a positive. It's just not bringing new information in at the end, like we often see in the sandwich method. But moving on to your more critical questions. Love these. The first one was about um, a speaker who's quite experienced. A good little technique you can use there is to actually say you um, pick something that they did well and say, I'd love if you'd done more of that. So if they were really good at interacting with the audience, you can say, it would have been great if you had even a bit more interaction. Here's where you could have put some more in. Okay, so that's one little trick you can use if you're really struggling to find a suggestion. Tell them to do more of something they're already excelling at. And then on the other end, and this is a lot more tricky in my opinion. When there's so many different problems, what do you pick to put into your evaluation? Well, remember what we spoke about there with the reference point for the, the project? The reference point of a, of a general speech is, is the message, what they're trying to convey, what they're trying to get across. So I would pick, let's say you've got eight different suggestions written down. I would pick the two that you feel would enhance their message more, would make it clearer, would make it more impactful, these kinds of things. And um, so that's how I would gauge what options to go for. Does that make sense, Wayne? Good, okay. Yes, I really like the idea of focusing on enhancing the message. And that implies yeah. also that the message and purpose of that speech was clear. So that would be a key point. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah, and there's a lot of speeches where the message is not clear at all. So definitely worth picking up on for sure. And um, any other questions from anyone? Okay, I think we got Eureka. Yeah. Hi, Georgia. Thank you very much. Hi, Kyle. Hi, Good everybody. Good to see you again, um, by the way. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, I used to be called Georgia, and I'm using my Greek name internationally. So, uh, I have seen you in competition, which you won in UK, and the big difference that I experienced is you presented a speech from start to finish. So, are you taking, so I want to go a little bit more in depth in, in your process. Are you keeping notes? And how do you manufacture the speech within the time you have? Because you have presented a full, well done, like almost prepared speech. So can you give us a little bit more of hints here? Of course, yeah. So one of the most important things in, a, in any evaluation is how you take your notes. And, and what I would recommend doing, I, I wish I could give you a visual example but basically if you have a piece of paper I would put a line down the middle of it and on one side I would be uh, put um, three okay three strands so I'd write one two three and then I would fill in the blanks based on what I'm seeing okay the three things I think the speaker did the best and then on the other side of the paper I'd have one two my two recommendations or suggestions and I'd fill them in as well. So then during the five minute break or so, or say the, the four minutes I have left of the break, I am then in my head rehearsing what I'm going to say, how I'm going to open, how I'm going to transition to my whole points and how I'm going to end. I literally run through the evaluation in my head. Now, of course, if you're the first speaker, uh, you've got less time to do this. It's a little harder. But if you are the, the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the more time you have, the, the crisper the evaluation is going to be. So that's the way I evaluate without any notes. I literally rehearse it in my head in the lead up to, to going out onto the stage. Does that make sense? Does that help? Yeah, although I think it takes a lot of uh, tries and errors because you've done it in an amazing way. Very, very inspiring, by the way. And uh, it stands out. It stands out. So congratulations again. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And I, and I should say that it's, it's not like a natural thing I have. What I actually did for the first two years of my, my Toastmasters career is more or less every day, I'd go on YouTube, I'd find a Toastmasters speech, I would watch it, and then I would stop it, give myself five minutes to write my evaluation, and then I'd deliver it to a camera and then watch it back. And, and people say you can't prepare for the evaluation contest or you can't prepare without going to a meeting. Not true. You can do this alone anytime, anywhere. If you've got a laptop, um, it is possible. So it's literally reps. And the more you do it, the easier it becomes. Uh, Liz, I see you've got a question there. Yes, thank you. So... I am looking for some encouragement. We're having a District 35 speech evaluation contest this year. There's no way I'm going to be good enough to crush it. But I know that I've heard people say that if you work on your evaluation skills, you become a better speaker. And you are a speech coach as well. So I'm just wondering if you can talk about people that you've worked with on their evaluation skills who have also experienced growth. Like you have real examples. What can you tell me? Well, I haven't done any coaching with individuals on their evaluations, apart from people in my, my club. Uh, what I would say is that certainly if you learn what makes a good speech through observing and through evaluating, you can then re-engineer that into your own presentations. It gives you that, that outside perspective, which is truly, truly invaluable in my opinion. So I think it's a great thing for even new people in Toastmasters to, to start doing, you know, get about an evaluation in early. And um, because the more you evaluate, the more you're going to understand what you should and should not be doing in your own presentations. And you get to see more speaking styles. If we just focus on our own style, then we limit our growth potential in terms of learning from others. Um, and, and then again, this is why going on YouTube, 
And watching different speeches and evaluating is great because you see how American speakers present, how people from Thailand present, how people in Japan present. It's all very different. And it rubs off on you consciously or subconsciously. So I think that's the real value, Liz, of just seeing the different styles and then you can bring them into your own game if you so choose to as well. Indeed. There's nothing to lose but everything to gain, basically, by evaluating. So definitely do your contest, 100%. Uh, Liz, go ahead. Uh, there's a question in the chat box from Jenny Liu. Jenny, would you like to ask the question or do you want me to read it? Uh, sure. The, the question is, how do you provide neurodiverse feedback that respects the speaker's growth constraints, if any? For example, if they cannot physically coordinate eye contact, um, with the audience due to brain motor dysfunctions, but we give them feedback, it may trigger some people, you know, feeling like they're trying their hardest, but they just really can't. So how can we also be respectful of that? And I think that's hard if you don't understand the speaker, which you usually don't get a chance to in the contest. Yeah, that's a really good question, Jenny. And by the way, I'm looking forward to speaking at your, your club as a dyslexic later on in the, the month. I think it is about awareness. I think we can often, we don't always get a sense, but we do get a sense when maybe something's going on that's preventing this individual from making eye contact or, or using their hands more or something like this. And it's, it's just about trying to be as aware as possible um, so that you can tailor your feedback to that particular individual. Um, as well. I mean, if someone literally can't walk and they're in a wheelchair, you don't want to give them feedback saying you could, you should stand up. That would be more impactful. That's not going to go down well and it's not effective. So it's about awareness. It's about awareness as much as possible. And if you do have a, a test, if you're organizing a contest and you have a test speaker who is, um, has a disability of some kind, maybe it is worthwhile flagging that with the contest chair and so forth so people are aware of that so that we can be sensitive in those situations as well. But that's a really nice question there, Jenny. Thank you for that. Okay, um, any other questions at all? I think we're on the green light. Does that mean we're on what, 17 minute scale? Something like that? We're actually past 10 minutes in the Q&A now. Okay, okay. Um, well, I think we've got one from Tom, and then we can round things up from there. Tom, do you want to ask your question? Tom, you may want to unmute yourself. He's keeping us waiting here, yeah. building up the suspense. Okay, I'm not sure if Tom's question is uh, is coming through after all. Type it in the chat, Tom, if that's easier for you, um, if you can. But hopefully today has given you a little bit of, a few tips here and there in terms of what you could potentially do for your evaluations. And, and I should also say that this stuff is not just about competing. It's not even just about Toastmasters. It's about giving effective feedback in all areas of life. If, if you're talking to your family and you don't demonstrate what you want them to do or give them an example of what you want them to do, they're probably not going to do it, right? So try and think about using these skills, not just in Toastmasters, but outside as well. Feedback is the breakfast of champions, and I hope today has helped you serve a fantastic five-star breakfast. So I'll hand it back to our Toastmaster now.